have skillet, we'll travel. <laughs> Well, good afternoon. It is really a pleasure to be here. My name is Carla Ramsdell. I am a physicist and a mechanical engineer. I'm of Italian heritage, and my work is on the thermodynamics of the food system. And I'd like to share with you an idea I have that home cooking has the power to change the world and to feed us on so many different levels. And I'd like to start with an example of a food system craving optimization and a return to its roots. So allow me to tell you the tale of a potato. Okay, so if you've ever grown a potato, you know that this is the gem of the garden, right? I like to think of it as the garden's introvert. So all season long, when those other extroverted vegetables are growing and shouting their accomplishments from the top of their lungs, right, that red pepper stands out among that green foliage saying, look at me, look at what I did, I am amazing, right? And the pumpkin goes, that is nothing, look at what I did. Who wouldn't want to have me on their front porch this Thanksgiving? I do some good work. Right, all the while, the potato is just laying underground, getting the job done. It knows what it's got to do. No pats on the back, no attaboys, right? It's just making things happen until harvest day. Okay, so if you've never harvested a potato, this is something to add to your bucket list, right? Because it's really phenomenal. You walk up with a hoe to this patch of ground that appears to be dead, and you stick your pitchfork in it, and you lean that pitchfork up, there's, there's a potato under there, right? I mean, there's actually a lot of potatoes under there. So you keep digging and it's like this treasure hunt of who can find the best potatoes. And they're big and they're beautiful. And you're like, how'd you guys all fit down there? Where have you been all this season, right? It's incredible. But that's not the amazing part. The amazing part is that a potato comes out of the ground shelf stable. Right, so at a time when you're processing all those high maintenance extroverted vegetables, right? They need pressure canning, you gotta figure out acidity ratios and headspace, and then some of them need to be blanched and you need an ice pack. This is all critical steps in our garden, I get it. But all the potato asks is that you put it out in the sun for a couple hours, let the skins harden up, stick it in a burlap bag, that's not Stick it in a burlap bag in a cool, dark place in your home, and there it will wait patiently for you until you need it for your next recipe. Now that's incredible. Okay, so now comes the crazy part. Our industrial food system, with the support of our purchasing dollars, has chosen to optimize these gems. Allow me to explain. We take this uh, perfectly imperfect, shelf-stable, intact potato, and we put it on a truck and we ship it to the potato manufacturing facility, right? And there we skin the potato, which removes like 30% of its nutrients and 50% of its protein, and we dice it into the perfect quarter inch cubes, right? Well, <clears throat> so there's a problem. Now we've exposed the flesh of the potato to the air, it's gonna turn brown, so we're gonna have to chemically treat it, right? Hmm. Not only that, but the chopping initiated the physical and nutritional deterioration of the potato. It's, it's not going to last very long now on the counter, so we're going to have to do something. <laughs> we're going to freeze it. Let's freeze it. Let's ask the 98% of that potato, this liquid water, to transform into its solid form, right? And so we're forever sort of transforming the texture of this potato to some kind of rubbery cube spud-like thing, right? Ooh. But there's another problem because we removed its package in the first step of the process. So we're gonna have to find another container. So we dig fossil fuels out of the ground, right? And we make them into a plastic bag and we print on the outside of the plastic bag some picture of a potato and we put the rubbery spuds in there, we seal it off and we put it in the freezer. Okay, so now that it's frozen, like someone might not actually use that potato for six months, maybe a year, but it's gonna have to stay frozen that whole time, right? Do we see the energy in this whole process? So that means freezer storage of the potato factory, freezer transportation from the factory to the grocery store. Because the energy of our food transportation system is an energy intensive enough, we're gonna do it in a freezer, right? And then energy storage of the grocery store, some of those don't even have doors on them. 
and then we're going to buy it, we're going to rush it home, and we're going to put it in our freezer. And there it's going to wait for us until we find a recipe that needs a diced potato. We're going to go to our freezer, we're going to unearth that gem for the second time, we're going to cut open the bag, um, dump the rubbery spuds into our mixing bowl, we're going to throw the bag away to the landfill because there's actually no market for that kind of recycled plastic yet. And on some level, we're going to think, ah, oh, that was so efficient, right? Okay. <clears throat> so, a disclaimer, I have no uh, really cooking skill, right? I have no uh, culinary training. The only cooking training I received was in my mom's kitchen from the time I was able to stand at the countertop, right? So this is a, this is a physicist and a potato up here, right? But we're going to go ahead and dice this potato just so I can show you that this really is not a, a really energy intensive process. It takes um, less than a minute to dice a pretty large potato. And I also want to make sure you understand that that story I just ran through is not a rarity. So it ends up the potato is the number one sold vegetable in the United States, and 40% of them are sold frozen. Um, so that's kind of a crazy situation. This isn't a rare instance uh, in any, any means. And I'm not really proposing that we all uh, grow our own potato. I understand that that's pretty impractical, right? But certainly we should be able to buy these potatoes um, at a grocery store or maybe at a farmer's market. <clears throat> so how did we get here? At what point did we start to think that this was a decent representation of, of this, right? Well, I think probably there's a lot of ways that we got here, but the one I'd like to focus on is that the more we buy our food pre-packaged and pre-chemically treated, right, pre-boxed and pre-bagged and pre-seasoned and pre-cooked, the more we lose an appreciation for the gem that started this whole process. See, we're an instant society, right? We like instant messaging, right? We drink instant coffee. We watch instant videos. And the latest craze in cooking right now is the instant pot, right? So all of a sudden, we like our food to be instant as well. But the problem is that when we optimize for time only, right, well, we end up compromising a lot of other factors. And one of those is our Earth energy system. So it ends up all the transportation, processing, and refrigeration of our food system takes an enormous amount of energy. And that energy requires that we burn a lot of fossil fuels. And the fossil fuels we burn produce um, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. So don't get me wrong, greenhouse gases are a great thing. If it weren't for greenhouse gases, we would not be here, right? It's the enhanced greenhouse gases, this big glug that we're putting out there that's really causing the problem. So the way greenhouse gases work is that we receive solar energy from the sun. This warms the Earth, right? And then the Earth emits its own infrared radiation. Well, this is where the greenhouse gases trap that energy and recycle it back down to the Earth's surface, causing this warming. So you can see as we get more and more players in the atmosphere, we get more and more recycling of this energy until we get to the warming that we have now that's quite unsustainable. So let's make sure we're all on the same page here. Here is a graph of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere over the last 800,000 years, right? So we're looking at just the blue line here. And we can see that um, we definitely have a natural variation in carbon dioxide concentrations, but we see where we are today, way up there at 400 parts per million, uh, way up there where that arrow is, is clearly outside of the range of this normal variation, right? We're in some new kind of territory. And if I put a landmark in here, Right about there, 250,000 years ago, is where our human predecessor, Homo erectus, showed up, right? And so our species hasn't really seen carbon dioxide at this level ever, right? And then if we look at the red line, we can see that that's, uh, that's the Earth's surface temperature. We can see there's an incredible correlation between the Earth's surface temperature and the amount of carbon dioxide that's in our atmosphere. So clearly we can't keep doing this, right? Um, and while a lot of climate change solutions seem kind of daunting and way out of our realm of something we can control, 
Um, 20 to 30 percent of global greenhouse gases come from our food system, right? For every one calorie of food we consume, 10 calories of fossil fuel energy goes into that food, right? We're going to have to find some way to make this um, a little more conscientious to our resources. And the good news is that we can impact this tonight in our kitchen. <clears throat> So I'm a bit of a, a cooking evangelist, right? I believe that the only way we're going to see to a sustainable food future is if we take back cooking. We reinvigorate a love of home cooking. Um, I believe that when we do so, then we will regain control of our, um, the ingredient sourcing, the ingredient biodiversity the transportation, the packaging, the processing. And in the process, I believe we become grounded again in this act that likely made us human. So Richard Wrangham of Harvard University has proposed what's called the cooking hypothesis. And in this, he says that, um, OK, so when we learned how to cook on a fire, we learned to master fire, and then we cooked on a fire, we relied on that external energy source to partially digest our food for us, right? So then the nutrients in that food were easier for our body to digest, so our body didn't have to work quite so hard. This allowed the energy that was previously used um, by our digestive system to be redirected to our brain. Right? And so then our, this probably is what gave rise to the intelligent species that we have become as humans. So evolutionarily, our species has relied on cooking for a really long time, and now all of a sudden abandoning this does not make us feel very good. We feel kind of empty, right? It ends up that it feels pretty good to dice a potato. Right? We actually need those rudimentary tasks in our day to be able to process the stress and information overloaded lives that we live sometimes. When I cook, I relax, and I gain perspective on things. And let's be honest with ourselves. <laughs> so if you're relying on that kind of industrial pre-processed food, that stuff just doesn't taste very good, right? Have you ever talked to somebody after they ate that and asked them, how was that? You know, you're probably not going to hear, that one's delicious. I cannot wait to get another one of those, right? At best, you're going to hear, that wasn't bad. That wasn't bad. Like, when have we been OK with eating food that wasn't bad? This stuff's supposed to be great. I'm not saying we got to throw down some really elaborate meal. It takes a lot of time. But to convert some really simple ingredients into um, some delicious food doesn't take very long at all. And so here's the good news, is that it ends up being a good time to be a cooking evangelist, because there appears to be a ton of enthusiasm around cooking. Um, it doesn't take long on YouTube to see how many YouTube videos are out there teaching us to cook. It doesn't take long in a bookstore to see how many cookbooks are out there, right? Um, the enthusiasm is, is really fantastic. And for most of you in this room who are college age, the timing couldn't be more perfect. Because in college, typically, is when you have a kitchen of your own for the first time. So you get to choose, am I going to use that room? Or am I going to rely on this processed uh, food system to provide my nutritional needs? Now, if we're going to cook, we probably need the right tools, right? And so my current research is on the thermodynamics of skillet material. It was kind of motivated by the fact that I talked to a lot of cooks in my work, and I realized some commonalities. Okay, one of which is they're a little bit crazy about their skillets. And not only that, that the skillet they're passionate about seemed to be about the same. They were all these cast iron skillets, so I had to beg the question, what is it about a cast iron skillet that's so phenomenal? Um, if you go shop for a skillet, right, the choices are a little daunting. You have cast iron, enameled cast iron, there's carbon steel, there's stainless steel with the tri-ply chlor, there's PFOA nonstick and ceramic nonstick, there's anodized aluminum. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's really hard to choose. And while there's not a perfect skillet for all situations, I will say that a cast iron skillet does a fabulous job. And so I'd encourage you to sort of reach out and try to cook in this medium. Usually what we cook on a skillet is fast and simple. Uh, it's typically low energy, right? We're only heating the, this skillet rather than the 30 pounds of steel that is our oven. You can actually cook a pizza on a skillet on the stove, right? My thermodynamic analysis has told me that it has the perfect combination of properties. Okay, the combination of its mass, 
It's specific heat, which makes it kind of thermally sluggish. It's relatively low conductivity when compared to other skillet materials. And it's high emissivity. These come together to make this fantastic thermal experience. And so what we cook is fabulous, and that's encouraging for us. It's actually also naturally nonstick, which is much better than all those sort of synthetic temporary coatings that we put on that will deteriorate over time. And it lasts for generations. I've heard stories of families that go into their grandmother's house after she's passed away, and the one thing they fight over is her cast iron skillet. I see people nodding in the audience. This is a big deal, right? These things are fabulous. And it's, uh, that pan costs $15, right? This is not expensive, so you really don't have a whole lot to lose, right? Now, bringing up home cooking or sort of uh, getting back into home cooking um, feeds us on a lot of other levels, too. It helps us connect to other humans. Right, so there was this national survey recently and asked the question, what expression do you most like someone to utter to you, right? Okay, so not surprisingly, number one was, I love you. Number two was, I forgive you. But number three was, dinner's ready, right? I mean, who doesn't love to gather around a table when someone's lovingly prepared a meal for us? That feels so fantastic. And we can connect across generational lines. So the next time you go home and you gather around a table with you know, extended family members, think to yourself, what's that, that recipe that I'm looking most forward to eating here, right? What is that thing that maybe defines my family that's been handed down for generations? And then ask yourself, do I know how to cook that thing? And if you don't, well, reach out to that ancestor. Maybe it's your, father's cor your grandfather's cornbread. Maybe it's your mother's lasagna. Whatever it is, ask if you can be involved in the preparation the next time. Because you are now the keeper of your family's recipes. I ate a lot of my grandmother's food when I was a child, but I regret that I never actually got into the kitchen with her and cooked. I think magic happens when multi-generations get together in the same kitchen. I'm so thankful my kids have had this opportunity with their grandmother. Clearly, I could go on and on here, right? The benefits of home cooking go far beyond grounding us as humans, giving us delicious food, connecting to our neighbors, healing our Earth's energy system, right? They also reduce our food budgets, which helps with food insecurity issues, which is a mounting concern on college campuses and throughout the world. <clears throat> and it also makes us eat healthier, because we don't tend to add all those um, additives, and we start usually with some more natural ingredients. So come on. You can't resist this, can you? Go forth and cook. You see, because if we rely on heavily processed food, that meal will feed you, and that it'll give you the calories you need to make it through to your next meal, yes. But if you start with whole food, real food, and and clean it, and chop it, and season it, and cook it, and adjust it, and smell it, and maybe ask someone to come over and join with you, this meal will feed you long before you've taken the first bite. Thank you.